is good soup. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to review the House of the Dragon season finale, The Black Queen. Here we are, already at episode 10. Feels like these last 10 weeks have gone by so quickly, at least for me. But for the most part, I've enjoyed this season very much. There are definitely some things that I took issue with in this episode, but I, I thought it was a very satisfying season finale that sets up season 2 and ends on a cliffhanger, and uh, I think we're going to see some character transformations in the coming seasons because of the events that happened over these last two episodes really gets the ball rolling like i said for future seasons but uh i don't know what did you think about this finale no i I really enjoyed it and i think this is definitely an episode i was looking forward to especially after last week seeing the blacks reactions to the greens putting usurping the throne and putting Aegon as king um and i think it played out very well i think you know i've already seen some people have some complaints and we'll, we'll talk about that and discuss it later but overall as a finale especially i think the first 10 and last 10 minutes i was thoroughly enjoying because seeing their reactions and seeing rhaenyra take her place as queen and trying to navigate the situation and i mean that that last 10 minutes just full of suspense the whole time you could just tell you know going into storm's end with the weather the rain and then you see aemon there you're like ah this is just not gonna end well and it didn't no no it did not I guess, you know, from Vagar's perspective, it ended well because she got a little snack, but for her little tum-tum. But, you know, Luke and Eamon, on the other hand, not not great. Yeah, the way that was shot was terrifying from Luke's perspective, too, just landing there and seeing that big dragon off in the distance. To me, the the idea of giant creatures is so terrifying to me. It's like when uh, the, um, the world serpent shows up in the God of War. It's just this massive creature. You're like, holy shit. Uh, that's how I felt for Luke. I mean, the perspective change, like when you see Luke's dragon, it's the dragon, you know, it's a nice dragon. And you just see Vagar and you're like, what the f- Like, yeah. they're not the same species. No those dragons (laughs) unless somehow they die in battle or they're encaged they're gonna keep growing yeah uh, so Vermax is basically just a little baby yeah uh vagar is absolutely terrifying um but yeah i think the most interested i was going into this episode was you know rhaenyra's reaction to everything um obviously they start off with that conversation with luke um basically talking about his place in all of this how he's a little hesitancy and has a lot of parallels with the younger rhaenyra about not really wanting and have not being sure of himself of being lord of driftmark or if he's ready or capable of that and i think that was obviously intentional because uh luke is definitely more prevalent in this episode than say jace and joffrey is just there sometimes (laughs) <laughs> um, but definitely getting more insight into Luke makes the ending a little bit more... It wasn't sad enough, but I think the moment shared between Rhaenyra and Luke makes that all the more saddening to watch. Right, and I think circling back to a criticism I've had is that the time jumps hurt moments like this. Mm-hmm. Even though the moments are very good, that's how they're sort of patching it up is because the performances between Rhaenyra and Luke are very genuine and you feel like they are mother and son, that they've had a loving relationship. These are conversations they've had before, but I sort of would have liked to have seen that play out maybe over the course of a season. But they did such a good job of casting the Valerian boys. They've got this sort of strong. high school letterman, <laughs> the strong boys. They've got this sort of high school letterman jacket vibe to them that they've good at sports and they, they come from a rich family and everyone's sort of jealous of them. And they know that, but they try and keep themselves humble, even though they are a little cocky. I think you see some of it more in Jace and Luke trying to sort of live up to his older brother being a bit better at him at sword fighting and more confident. You see that Luke still has that, you know, he grabs her near his hand before they have to leave. So he's coming of age Mm -hmm. and then he's not at the end there. But yeah, it's a very good scene. But it's like I I keep imagining in a different timeline, we got to spend an entire season with Chase and Luke. And then this is the end of his arc for a season. But yeah, that was a, a, a good scene. And Rhaenyra still has people have this perception of her that everything comes so easily to her that she's perfect that's what he calls her Uh, and we know that that's not necessarily true that we saw all the trials and tribulations she went through so yeah he's feeling the weight of his responsibilities and she wants to to lift that weight off of him it's a scene that we'll never see with alicent and her children so just the contrast there that rhaenyra has a way healthier relationship with her kids that she can sort of take off the mask and be motherly it's not always about duty it's just about reassuring your love for your child and how far that goes for them so that's yeah it makes the ending even that much more heartbreaking 
I guess I wanted more heartbreak. I mean, he got chomped. <laughs> hungry, hungry hippo style. <laughs> Yo, straight off, like, yeah. got fit in the uh, Vagar's mouth. Yeah. She's a big, big girl. Well, Luke is just, right, just dead on impact. I hate to be that brutal about it, but he just got chomped. No, he got, yeah. Yeah, Vermax just kind of, the way it ripped him apart, dude, just fell to the ocean in pieces. <laughs> Confetti. We'll get back to that. Yeah. No, but uh, another <laughs> childbirthing scene that was, maybe takes the cake as the most uncomfortable, Yo, which is unbelievable to say. They kept showing the dead fetus. I, I look, like, I... I, I yeah no, I looked away I um, couldn't do it but I think it's well obviously Rainey's comes on dragon back to Dragonstone to give the news of the greens and all their treachery and that causes definitely caused a reaction in Rhaenyra and yeah so that was um that was a bit chaotic huh like the infancy of their plans to decide what they're gonna do now um but also with Damon taking head of trying to get the Ravens out and confiding with the Maesters and the Knights, and you have Rhaenyra uh, going through this miscarriage. Um, it was just so many things happening at once, I feel. It was kind of difficult to keep up, and obviously the brutality of her situation and her bleeding and the blood and the stillborn was just... It was uh, uncomfortable. Right, yeah. You're ha she's having these birth complications but they have to make preparations. They don't know if they're going to be attacked. So that adds an element of chaos to everything that's happening. When she's in that state and she calls in Luke and Jace, right there is an example of you must continue your duty. Even when you're in the midst of having a miscarriage, you need to let your heirs know if anything happens to me, you guys are the ones who inherit my power and all decisions should still be going through me. So there's sort of this rift between Damon and Rhaenyra. And I think that was an interesting choice making Damon so he was itching for war, itching for conflict. When he gets the news about Viserys, he claims that Alicent and the Greens had him killed. We, last, time, last time we saw him, he was so spry. Jogging to the throne, he made that speech, he was in good shape. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, he fucking skedaddled right up there, didn't need any help whatsoever. Yeah, oh man, they must have murdered him. He was going to take out his knife and kill Vaiman. So, uh, I don't know if they've dumbed Damon down for this episode to create sort of a artificial, inauthentic tension between Rhaenyra and Damon because we haven't seen this much tension between them before. And I guess when you're on the, when you're in the midst of, when you know war is coming, when the storm is coming, uh, I guess it could, characters can change where they can act out of character and the instincts take over. He's always been a warrior and a fighter. So in his mind, he's thinking we need revenge. This is something that they've stolen from us. We need to get it back right away. He, he's in a hurry here. He's got all these plans about how we can snuff out the greens, heads on spikes and take back the Iron Throne within a few weeks. And Rhaenyra is like, slow down there, pup. Well, look, Damon's always been very impulsive and chaotic and, you know, we've seen many different sides of him. Um, I think the intention here was to give all of that impulsive need for action, throw it on Damon, and present Rhaenyra as more collected and rational in this moment. And I don't think that's a stretch by any means. I mean, Damon, I love Damon as a character, but let's, uh, I think people are hyping him up to be this romantic type misunderstood when I think the answer is what we see in this episode is that he is chaotic he is impulsive sometimes he lets either his angers or frustrations get the better of him um and obviously with that moment we were near her and choked her um i don't think that's something that necessarily shocked me like this is out of character for somebody who's you know murdered his ex-wife oh no no it was the horse yeah come on um i think some like damon fans have been upset like in the moment when he had they cut that embrace with his daughters after their mother died and here where he can show a little bit more sympathy do you want to speak to the maester my friends Like I said, I, I think this is kind of what Damon is, and we kind of see him maybe not reconcile it, but at the end of the episode when he does kind of console Rhaenyra, uh, even though there's no dialogue there, you could tell it's a somber moment shared between the two of them. Even though Luke isn't his son, we kind of seen him ingratiate himself in that family to an extent. So... Yeah, I think it just further complexes Damon. Uh, he was getting a little annoying when he kept cutting Rhaenyra off and kind of taking control of the situation like he's in charge. Um, but I think that's just a conflict of his own ego and maybe still having 
yes, you can declare Rhaenyra queen, but when push comes to shove and decisions are being made, I think Damon in his mind still thinks he's the best one to make these decisions at times. Yeah, and Damon, like you said, it's no surprise that he would be prone to domestic violence. They haven't written the relationship in that way before. It always seems like he was he had a soft spot for Viserys and an even softer spot for Rhaenyra. So I think maybe it was a little jarring. And Damon seems like a character you wouldn't put anything past him if there's a point to it. So the first introduction we have when he takes the city watch and he's killing all those criminals, he's trying to establish his power. Yeah. That it's not going to be that easy to get rid of me because I have men who are loyal to me. No, there's always reason to his impulses, even though he usually he doesn't act in it in maybe the most civilized way. Right. Um, there is a cause and effect, so to speak. Here was something that kind of just happened out of just pure impulse that really had no, like, he killed his wife because he wanted to be with Rhaenyra um, and get out of that marriage. He killed uh, those people with the city watch because he wanted to establish some type of law and order and clean up the streets. There's always been a reason for his madness, let's say. Here it was kind of just thrown in there, I feel. But it it doesn't shock me because I think when you romanticize these gray characters that have proven to do bad things in the past, I mean, I'm not surprised that they continue to do bad shit and can also be in other scenes show some goodness to them as well. I think that's what Damon is. Right, but they've definitely made changes to the character of Rhaenyra, where in the book, she we definitely saw it in the first five episodes with Millie Alcock's version of Rhaenyra, where she is a bit more fiery. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to paint her, like you said, as more collected and reasonable, not wanting to plunge the realm into civil war. But I wish they took some of the fire out of Damon in this episode and poured a little bit more into Rhaenyra. And you see it at the end of the episode, so maybe that's where that character is heading. Yeah, I think the intention is to save it to season two and making the death of Luceris her point of, okay, now it's time to fucking burn them alive with my dragon. Maybe not to that far extent, but give her more of that fire. Where peace is over, you killed my son, the time for peace is ended. But don't Damon and Rhaenyra have these conversations about Viserys' death and what possibly may happen? Otto was prepared for it for years. So for him to be to hear this news and to become so reactionary to it was a little, I think, inconsistent with the character. You would think that a character as smart as Damon and, and Rhaenyra would be prepared for this and they would be more on the same page. Maybe... Uh, My expectations weren't met because I was anticipating a more united front with Team Black. I think the events of Episode 9 made me, uh, like you said, very interested to see how they would respond as a team. And so in Episode 9, you saw the infighting with the Greens, and now there's some infighting with the Blacks. And I I don't know if maybe it was something that they could have avoided and still made it a great episode, because that ending is really what brings it home. I, I said it on the last review, and maybe I'm just mad because they've contradicted my thoughts on him, that even though he does horrible things, he still serves Rhaenyra. I don't know, maybe I, I just wanted them to be a bit more united, like when she gets coronated. That was a great moment. Yes, that was very good. We're all going to bow down to Rhaenyra. And I think, you know... She had Viserys' crown. It looked... It reaffirms her resolve. She was a little shaky, obviously, in episode eight when she's asking Viserys about the prophecy and should I continue with this. But she's seeing all these people that believe in her. The realm's delight. So there are, like Beastberry said, Rhaenyra's got friends. She's got allies. She's got dragons. She's a very well-respected and revered figure in the Seven Kingdoms. And I don't think Damon should be above showing her th- that respect that I think the character has earned. So some of the tension between them, it, it feels a little contrived. Like when Damon's threatening the Kingsguard and he's got Caraxes by his side, it shows that, yeah, he is impulsive. He is unhinged. He can maybe take things too far, but he's still doing it for Rhaenyra. So even when Otto comes and he says, like everyone's seen it like once Aegon was born everyone saw it besides you and Damon. <laughs> like I think that's Oh you and your father yeah yeah you and your father I think that speaks to kind of maybe they knew shit could have gone awry but I think at the end of the day they were confident in their position and it was kind of set in stone for them um, which you can say that's maybe makes them seem a little bit too naive yeah um, but I don't know I, I think when they get the news from Rainey's and by the way Rainey's kind of that's why I wasn't getting too caught up in what happened at the end of the last episode. She basically confirms that kind of the things we were saying that it's not her war to start. And 
Um, and you even see Rhaenyra's reaction where she doesn't know what to do at first. So for Rhaenys to pull the trigger last episode and basically force her hand into a war that she's not even comfortable starting in this episode, I think that all kind of comes together nicely. But when Rhaenys gets there, like the clock, they're already behind. So I think seeing them kind of scramble and maybe not being on the same page kind of is uh, maybe something natural because they're already behind the loop here. They got to get these ravens out two days after, you know, and I think that kind of forces their hand, especially with getting Jace and Luke out as fast as possible to kind of cover grounds and so I think it is a bit of a scramble here and Rhaenyra has to decide whether she even wants this and I think that's kind of where that disconnect comes between her and Damon. Yeah that is a good point that it is sort of this mad scramble the Greens have been making all these preparations but that's the the scene when she is crowned was a great moment for her character like I said it was an emotional moment and I love how Rhaenys is the only one not to bend the knee. (laughs) She sort of got this pass because she was supposed to be the queen. So I guess that's the sort of unspoken respect that they have between them. Imagine she beheaded her. <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> Yo, bend the fucking knee. And she gets to wear her father's crown. So, And uh, the contrast between Chris and Cole crowning Aegon versus Sir Eric it was way more honorable. Yeah. Uh, and the way he crowned her and just reaffirming his oaths. So that was a great moment. She was a, a little bit nervous, a little jittery to start that first council that she has. No, that's the litmus test right there. You have surrounded by... Everyone's looking at you. Men of the realm, pretty right. much. Just, you know, in this world, probably have some hesitancy about a, a woman ruler, a queen. Um, so it's really important for her to establish that she's in control and she knows how to handle this type of situation. And I think Damon doesn't help her at all by constantly undermining her. And I think Rhaenyra realizes that and tries to take control of the situation. But yeah, I think that wasn't a a great look for her first introduction with Damon, kind of constantly either not opposing her, but trying to take control at the same time. But I think she slowly, not slowly, but gradually picks up more confidence and becomes uh, becomes more comfortable as her place as queen throughout the episode right and i think the reason why i hate doing this but what i would have liked to have seen was rhaenyra taking charge and having some of those qualities that damon have it could still be them them trying to play catch up but allow rhaenyra to be the one who's pressing them being more confident in that moment maybe that's something that could have changed and like you said eventually she does become more confident and they're trying to paint her as the level-headed uh, queen who is going to hear out Otto's proposal, hear out Aegon's proposal, consider this offer for peace. Because, uh, like she said, when dragons go to war, everything burns. So those aren't <laughs> those aren't decisions that you need to take lightly. All right, guys, before we get to the second half of this review, I want to give a quick shout-out to our sponsor for today's episode, Smile Brilliant. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the variations of teeth whitening on the market. Items like LED lights, whitening strips, charcoal, and whitening toothpaste might sound good in theory, but they don't fully get the job done like one of Smile Brilliant's custom-fitted whitening trays. LED lights will accelerate the process, but they won't make your teeth whiter and could lead to teeth sensitivity. Whitening strips totally neglect gum lines, crevices, and molars. They work, but your remaining stains will become more prominent. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down the tooth enamel while whitening tooth pace only works on surface stains. But with one of Smile Brilliant's custom-fitted whitening trays, you can freshen your smile without worrying about damaging your teeth or leaving behind any noticeable stains. Historically, whitening trays were only dispensed by dentists at a price of $300 to $1,000. That all changed when Smile Brilliant came up with their innovative lab direct process that is not only less expensive, but far more effective in achieving that picture-perfect smile we all crave. And right now, you can visit SmileBrilliant.com and use promo code NERDSOUP to save 20% off all products, including their custom-fitted teeth whitening trays or custom-fitted night guards if you're someone like me who grinds your teeth in their sleep. They also have a great selection of professional oral care products, such as electric toothbrushes, water flosser, dental probiotics, and much more. And remember, that's promo code NERDSOUP for 20% off all products, so don't wait. Click that link and take care of your teeth. It's so important. So, so important. I thought it was funny when Otto, uh, when she throws the hand of the kingpin and uh, the, the knight comes with uh, something to bring him. I'm like, oh, it's got another pin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, well. <laughs> uh, but it is the page of the book that uh, Rhaenyra ripped out uh, earlier in the season and gave to Allison. It's such a half ass attempt to reconcile. I know, yeah. Emotional manipulation. Remember that time we used to read books in the Godswood? So don't start a war. <laughs> <laughs> 
I also think, you know, that with House Valerion, I guess a lot of people knew they were going to side with Team Black, but they kept their uh, allegiances a bit of a mystery. <laughs> Rhaenyra and Damon are assuming they're going to have the Valerion fleet, and Rhaenys is in the background like, oh, okay, that's quite the assumption. Oh, my fleet? Right. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll see. And uh, and then Corlys does come in, and he reaffirms his vows. I thought that was a great back and forth when he says, oh, Otto broke his oath, and Rhaenyra goes, yeah, that's the same oath you swore. Are you ready to break it right now in front of your queen? Nice moment to see, similar to the coronation, where once again, reaffirming the support and reaffirming the trust that they have in Rhaenyra, even though she was, they think she's complicit in their son's death. Yeah, even that conversation between Rhaenys and Corlys, I thought that was a nice moment between the characters. Obviously him hearing the news of everything that's been going on since he's been away, but how she just felt abandoned. And I think Corlys having that moment where his ambition for the Iron Throne has just caused nothing but devastation. I know, they've done all this for just And they just want to be out of it. But I do think once, was it Rhaenys who uses their granddaughters, right? And Jace and Lucerys as kind of their motivation to join the fray because as long as they're alive, betrothed to their grandchildren, that they're a threat to Aegon and the Greens. So they kind of have to join. A civil war is about to break out that could possibly kill all of your future heirs. And he's like, let's retire. Let's just move to Florida get one of those really nice homes we've saved up we've done well well once again the time jumps i don't get the impression that these are two people who lost everything i get the impression that these are two people who are ready to go to war and do some cool things (laughs) they seem fine to me even though i love the actors and i thought this was actually the best performance steve tucson has given as corliss like i said the back and forth with rhaenyra the way he's questioning her still asserting his power he's he knows how valuable he is to their cause because he's got that valerian fleet so it's sort of the job interview where he flipped it on its head what do you do for me even though i know that you're <laughs> even though i know i have to protect my grandchildren but still what are your qualifications well, they know how to make an entrance obviously at the wedding that was such a badass entrance but even here even though their family is basically non-existent there's like four of them that come now um as as compared to when they had this grand entrance and they had this large showing of strength um but now you have corliss a little bit banged up but he still makes that impact right away and i think that was my favorite scene of the episode um him swearing allegiance and kind of them laying out the groundwork of, wait, we actually have the advantage here. Cut off all the trade routes, they have a plan in place, they can lay siege to King's Landing, and you know, maybe war in theory, but like, not this type of dragons burning each other and masses dying and putting the kingdom to the torch. What Rhaenyra desperately wants to avoid, they can do it in kind of the most humane way, if that makes sense, um, by strategically placing their dragons and what trade routes they control and laying siege. Um, I think that's definitely an avenue that Rhaenyra would prefer, but talking about the strengths they can garner in the north and the control of the step zones and, you know, uh, Rhaenys patrolling with her dragon, I think that was seeing everything come together in that moment for them, realizing that, yeah, we we actually have the advantage. We have more dragons than them. You know, we don't, we can, we have the narrow sea. You know, they have the west with the Lannisters, but what seems like they were painted as, like, the heavy underdog in the beginning, now they realize, like, no, we actually, this is something we can do we just need to get storms and the area in the north yeah that gives them a, a boost in morale boost in their confidence of their chances and the split between Rhaenyra and Damon is also about using the dragons and he brings up the wild dragons that are living at Dragonstone that was cool he obviously goes to visit Vermithor and he's singing to the old King Jaehaerys's dragon who's massive and I always forget the scaling but he's up there with yeah. Vagar. I think he's the second largest. Yeah, and uh, some of the wild dragons are pretty big as well, and they named a few of them. They didn't name the cannibal. Can't wait for the cannibal. But like I said, Rhaenyra doesn't want to use the dragons just yet because of all the destruction that they can cause. And they keep talking about this idea that Targaryens are bonded to their dragons, that they control them. But at the end of the day, as Daenerys said, a dragon is not a slave. And we saw that with that final scene. The instincts take control. These are predators. So... You may think that you have control of them, but once you put those bad boys on the battlefield, all bets are off. So I also got a kick out of Damon telling Rhaenys what she was going to do, and Rhaenys is like, we haven't pledged. <laughs> well, we have we have Rhaenys' dragon. Yeah, we have Rhaenys' dragon. She's like, like, what? Do you? I have Rhaenys' dragon. I am Rhaenys. Uh, 
the audacity of that man in this episode. Well, she kind of checks him about the Song of Ice and Fire. She's kind of like, wait, you don't, you don't, you didn't, he didn't tell you about that? I oh, guess he didn't love you. Viserys never really considered Damon the true heir. He was just the placeholder until he had a son, so he never shared this information with him. And I think that adds an interesting uh, element to Rhaenyra's motivations that obviously became very personal there at the end, but she feels that she's got duty that's bigger than all of this because of the looming threat in the North. But Damon makes a good point that Viserys was too lost in his dreams and his prophecies and that hurt him as a ruler. So I guess that's kind of the last thing he wanted to hear in that moment. Wars on your doorstep, and she's talking about prophecies and the White Walkers and shit. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? But I see, th- I, I, with the whole choking, just give me a screaming match. If you really want to create tension. Yeah, because she doesn't really outwardly um, confront Damon about him kind of trying to take control of everything. Um, right, that could have been something interesting too. Why the fuck do you keep undermining me, dude? Yeah. If we want to win this war, I'm going to be the one calling the motherfucking like, fucking shots. Pull rank. Yeah. Ass. And Damon has shown that he doesn't always follow orders, but you would think that Rhaenyra would be the best one to sort of calm him down. And it's like she was caught off guard by his actions in this episode as well. And like you said, Damon has proven to be a violent, abusive guy. So it's not so out of the realm of possibility that he would do this to someone he claims to love. I totally get that he's going through a tough time here. He just lost his brother. He lost another child in childbirth. It's the second time that he's had that happen to him. He can't even confront this reality, comfort Rhaenyra when she's calling out for him. It's too much for him to bear, and he collapses on the beach. I get it. It's definitely a tough day, and he's reeling. He's anxious for revenge. I think it's a a bit inconsistent with his character to act this way towards Rhaenyra, and I think the writers have done this throughout the season as they've made this effort to keep him colder in instances where maybe he he could have been warmer, and we've seen it with, with moments that they've cut out. But I don't think him lashing out at Rhaenyra in this episode fixes any of the problems that he's facing. I think you already feel bad enough for Damon, and you can keep the sort of jittery vibes that he has about wanting to fight this war, but... I just don't think Damon is this person that some of his fans make him out to be. So, like, obviously I don't, like, like him in this moment when he does that to Rhaenyra, but I'm also saying that that's not out of character, and maybe you shouldn't have romanticized him in a way just because you think he's, like, cool and hot. I've just already seen the reactions of, like, character assassination, and I think that's far, far from that. It's uh, maybe not the best written scene or the best moment to be happened, but to see that and be like, they ruined Damon, meanwhile, that I don't think that's out of left field for that type of character. What they establish and what's established in the books, uh, it's not to the point where they completely change his character, and that's how a lot of people are taking it. But it's also, not only does he undermine Rhaenyra in the story, but I think the writing sort of undermines Rhaenyra, that he wouldn't respect her authority in this episode. And I think she's earned that as a character over the years, especially the relationship that they've had together. That there are some people that, even if you are just the worst bastard ever, that you're not going to challenge, because you just respect them too much. And I think Rhaenyra has earned it where... Keep your fucking hands off of her. They keep trying to make the women as these level-headed, reasonable characters. Let them be a little authoritarian at times. <laughs> There's a tinge of fear there that I think Rhaenyra should command that they've stripped from her a little bit. I do think that character has not lost some of her fire, but I think it got reignited with what happened at the end. So I think we might see some... I don't think she got... I don't want to say complacent during being a mother. and, But, you know, I think that's... Not a huge jump to say that motherhood and the situation has changed her as a person to the point where maybe she has looked at the world with a little bit more reason over the past years, and her main focus really is her children. I I think the significance of Luke's death and what that is going to do to her as a character, I think we're going to see a lot of that fire come back. And I think just for the, I mean, for the purpose of just storytelling and leading into season two, that they kind of wanted to save some of that for beginning of season two. What did you think about them recreating the scene on the steps of Dragonstone with Otto and Rhaenyra comes flying in once again behind them? Yeah, I think that's... <laughs> First time as an ally, second time as a adversary. That's such a great moment to, like, for her to basically corner them in. See, that's like some of the Rhaenyra you want to see. Like, it's not a threat in what she says or does, but in action. Like, it's a very veiled threat. Like, you're you're trapped here, and we can kill you if we wanted to. 
Right, and I think the idea of duality of people in these situations, I think it would have been better to just solidify the two sides of Rhaenyra, where she can be soft around her children and motherly and loving. But when it comes to be Queen Rhaenyra, she she changes, she shifts gears a bit. And you see it in that scene with Otto. She shows her strength by showing up on the dragon. She calls him out. She throws away the hand of the kingpin, like he said. He jumps in after it. No, I'm just kidding. But I thought that was a nice callback to uh, the scene that she did have with Damon. And that's where you see the beginnings of the split where Damon, what the hell is that? That's a book you used to read? I I don't like this. And I want more of that from Rhaenyra because I think Emma Darcy's really good at portraying her when it's time to command a room. I think she's got that presence similar to Millie Alcock. Every time they show Rhaenyra with the crown and uh, I think it's, we always say this character has a kingly presence and I think she does uh, as well. Kingly, queenly presence where it just has this majesticness uh, about them in this character. And I, I think that, and that's what I said earlier, I think as the episode progresses, you kind of see her be more confident in her position as queen because I know you can prepare for it all you want, but once it happens, it's just that sudden shift. By the way, yo, that table when they light the fire under and you see Incredible. everything come up it was so beautiful. I don't think Daenerys knew that that had it fe- that ha- it had that feature. <laughs> it's got a lava feature. Yeah, <laughs> that's why Tyrion was a terrible hand. But that's when they kind of start discussing. All right, we got to get to the Eyrie. We got to get the Craig and Stark in the north and go to Bor. Yeah. And, uh, Did they pause for clapping? <laughs> How Stark. Yeah, oh shit, it's my favorite moment of the episode. And obviously with House Baratheon, um... Sons of bitches. I I did like that, like obviously I think the focus is definitely more on Luke, and knowing what was going to happen, I obviously knew that was intentional. Uh, But even watching it, I was on the edge of my seat, uh, my heart was racing. Oh yeah. It was just... I felt so bad for him. Setting the stage, he just dusted it in there. I mean, Lucerus has like this, I don't know, he just, he's not scared, but he... He is scared. He's a little nervous. He's a he's fourteen because Rhaenyra says that he was they're the same age when she was given this responsibility. Um, and sure, you want everyone to handle it like Rhaenyra did when she was younger and embrace it and be confident in her position. But most people, this is so new to them. Like the dragons have never been in battle. Um, he's never been in battle, and being given this such important task and basically going out on your own, it's a scary thing. It is, right, and his is supposed to be the shorter and safer flight. Hmm. So they send Jace to Winterfell and to the Eyrie. You'd think that would be a bit more dangerous, but when you factor it in, Storm's End is closer. So him arriving there and seeing Vagar in the distance, that giant silhouette, and he can't stop looking over at it. So he's always looking over his shoulder, and when he arrives in the hall, who's standing there? Eamon. This guy is so cool, even though what he does in this episode is fucked up. He was but kind he, of dweebish when he was, give me that eye. <laughs> right, well, he, I think he can also be, yeah, I think he is a little bit of a dweeb at times and still insecure and childish. It's a childish thing to demand of Luke after all of these years. I mean, you know, you fucking lost an eye, but at least you have a nice sapphire scaring the hose. <laughs> I mean, I think he gave him a little upgrade. He, I thought the deal was already sentenced. Like, oh, you got Vagar, I lost an eye. I thought he was okay with that. Yeah, what the hell? Guess thought you, you thought you were so cool when you said that in a room packed of people. Now all of a sudden you want my fucking eye. Um, and Boros Baratheon, <laughs> you didn't even come here with an edible arrangement. At least they came with gifts. You come here with nothing. But I think Luke did handle himself well, even though he is afraid and you could see the fear on his face. He's brave in those moments. Yeah, and he very. speaks with confidence. Uh, he's obviously turned down and forced to retreat and that whole retreat sequence the chase of him going under the rocks and or even when they set it up when like i said he's constantly looking over his shoulder and you see that big fucking dragon shadow over him in the clouds it was terrifying they've done such a good job of that all season of making the dragons a terrifying presence they're not sugarcoating that so even though it is aemon trying to fuck with his nephew play this little cat and mouse game chase him around and maybe just let him go back uh, you know with his tail between his legs uh spook him a bit yeah but it just goes too far and that goes to my point about the dragons are not slaves that the instincts do take over and shit like that can happen what instinct did that little ass dragon have to be like i could take this i could take vagar he panicked so run that's the that's the number one instinct get the fuck out of there he's trying to prove himself that he can be (laughs) you know i could fight (laughs) poor little guy you know when uh 
Daenerys' the dragons were little and all they could do is roast the little piece of meat. That's basically what that was to Vagar. Did it get two degrees warmer? <laughs> And people have criticized that as well, that they wanted Aegon, or they wanted Aemon to kill Luke in cold blood. They yeah. wanted that to be the intention from the very beginning. As soon as they lock eyes in the hall, I'm going to kill this dude unless he rips out his eye. And I know he's not going to do that. I'm basically just setting him up for failure. I don't think that's a stretch that, you know, kind of lose, they both lose track of their dragons. Um, I think a young dragon, a young dragon rider, I think in that situation, like you said, they are kind of, dragons are not a slave, so they do have some capacity to act on their own accord. For Aemon, I think it's something where, I think when you talk about like with Damon, how they keep trying to establish that he might not, not always a great guy. Um, I think for Aemon too, I think they've been a little bit hesitant to kind of portray him as super psychopathic or right. just fully evil. Um, because it is an accident and he does kind of, I don't know if he regrets it or shows remorse for the situation. I think it's just him understanding, like, I just started a war. Yeah, definitely. And you, you drew first blood, so they have every reason to retaliate. But I think even if it is an accident, it's like dangling somebody over a roof and being Mm -hmm. like, oh, look, I could push you. I could, oh, he slipped. Yeah. You're still dangling somebody over a fucking roof. Yeah. If anything goes wrong, it could end tragically, and it does. So that, for me, I, I totally get where they're coming from. I, I think the scene still would have been really disturbing and unsettling if Eamon was just trying to kill him. But the fact that he loses control of that giant beast and decides to just rip through this young boy and rip the dragons to shreds, I'm, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It is so disturbing and terrifying and frightening you're going to put yourself in this position and then totally lose control of it to me that that's a little bit more unsettling and it makes my skin crawl uh and you do uh, uh, <laughs> you see the remorse on his face and it could be more for i just started a war and this is going to have grave consequences and also damn i just killed my nephew yeah we've had yeah. beef but holy uh, i've never killed somebody i've never killed family before so that's could be a bit traumatic and maybe could lead him down this darker path right where it's sort of like jamie where he felt like he had no choice with killing the mad king and he got called the kingslayer the kingslayer you're a terrible guy and he was like you know what i'll, I'll just embrace it then yeah so maybe aemon just goes on to embrace the moniker of kinslayer well it's a hard down defense on it. when he goes home and he like it was a total accident it's like yeah we got word from uh lord baratheon that you were seen chasing after him with a knife asking for give me to give me that eye so. Right, yeah. Even the people who are on his side will have a hard time believing it is an accident. Uh, and, and the enemies aren't going Just to. Just a bunch of accidents. I know. The, the writing this season has leaned into that a lot. That Whoops, we kind of slipped on a banana peel and fell into a civil war. Whoa, 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 whoa. But yeah, I don't know. For me, the scene still, I knew what was happening and it still broke my heart. Uh, I, even the more I talk about it, I said in the beginning that maybe it would have hit harder if we spent more time with Luke, but I sort of take that back. Even The more we talk about it, it's just this sweet young kid who's trying to do the best, trying to please his mother, do his duty as a prince, and they put him in this game where, you know, he ends up becoming the prey for the world's biggest predator. Uh, It's just a terrifying cat and mouse game. And shot so skillfully, the idea of being stalked by this giant monster in the sky knowing that you can't really do anything, just trying desperately to escape through the storm. It just shot beautifully. No, I think it looked beautiful too. I think even with them flying, I mean, obviously using the the darkness and the rain to kind of, you know, make the CGI appear better on screen. But I think there was a ton of suspense, the shadows of Vagar, the chase sequence. But when he finally goes up above the clouds and it's all clear and it looks <laughs> like that and just woof. See, I thought he was going to eventually die in the clouds, in the rain, and we weren't going to see it. But the fact that they brought them into the sunlight and had this man chomped in broad daylight. I wonder if fans who didn't know what was happening got the rug pulled out from under them. They're feeling nervous. Maybe Luke isn't going to get out of this and he ascends over the clouds. He's home free and then he fucking dies. So I'm interested to hear uh, the perspectives that I'm interested to see some of the opinions on people who didn't know Luke was going to die. And I wonder if they did telegraph it a bit by all the attention they paid to Luke and Rhaenyra in this episode. Yeah, I, I wonder if I, that's because I was just privy to the, and from like, I was privy to what was going to happen that those scenes stood out to me. But uh, yeah, I wonder if no, if someone is just going into it blind picks up on, not foreshadowing, but kind of 
leading into it. <laughs> Once he went above the clouds, I thought, oh shit, man, it's over for this dude. I was just waiting for it the entire time. The way they stretched it out for the book readers, I think, was pretty clever. Uh, so there is this possibility of him getting away. He's escaping. He's maneuvering. He's he's more nimble than the giant Vagar. But man, once that dragon gets gets its claws on you, it's a wrap. It is funny. Like, Rhaenyra was just relying on honor to get the Baratheons. It's like, oh, well, Rhaenys is kind of Baratheon, so... Right, yeah, Rainey's. She's her uh, her mom. You couldn't throw in like a... They've exhausted all their fucking marriage packs. But you have Hand of the King, you could be Lord of... Uh, Master of Coin, or... And the way she talked him up, <laughs> set him up for failure. They're gonna be honored to receive you, you're gonna sh- show up with your dragon. And meanwhile, the biggest fucking dragon in the world is already there. There's gonna be a feast. <laughs> They're gonna love you. They have a great music, great food... Crepe station, balloon animals, <laughs> fondue, cigar rollers. You can't smoke that. You're a kid. I think if you can ride a dragon, you can. I guess so. Yeah, smoke. at that point. R.I.P. Lucerus Valarian. Well, the, I mean, you could say that Emma Darcy's best acting of the season was in that final scene, and I think this may have been their strongest episode from an acting perspective. Uh, and like I said, seeing the two different sides of Rhaenyra, I wish they would have uh, solidified those sides a little bit more. But I like seeing her with the kids, yeah. and then ruling as the new queen, and then that scene at the end like i said the look on her face the fury the fire it all comes rushing back but it's not going to be like the spunky cheeky witty rhaenyra it's going to be more of daenerys in season eight or heading trending towards that direction yeah i think you can lead into that the way they did i don't think maybe you you want to see some glimpses that she's capable of being the dragon sometimes but um, as far as Emma Darcy is concerned, I think they were probably the strongest in episode eight, especially with that scene with Viserys for me. Um, I think once this character kind of makes that turn and they're allowed to kind of react to, we finally see the reaction and dialogue they have after uh, Lucerus' death. I think that's when they're able, they're, they'll are they be really able to kind of sink their teeth into this character and take it to probably a different level. Because we've seen the impact of how characters adapt and change to these crazy events that happen within Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon in the past. So um, this is probably up there for any, uh, as a motivator, I think this is probably up there with any, you know, horrifying action that's ever happened to any of these characters right yeah losing your second son who is only 14 years old so being struck by tragedy can force characters to make drastic decisions make things acting out of character and i think the weight of that moment will be felt all throughout season two that's going to be the thing that gets the ball rolling (laughs) now we have to wait two years to just see how everybody is going to react to this information from both sides we got our craig and stark moment yeah. This is going to be a... And she tells Jace... Around you know, the he's... same age, so I, I think some people have been casting older, or fan casting a bit older actors, so... <laughs> yeah, I know, Henry Cavill. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're going to get Henry Cavill. No. Because you, you can't... You could sell me on some of these ages and differences, but like Olivia Cook being only like two years older than her children or whatever uh, in real life, but or the people who play her children... Uh, No way Jace and Henry Cavill are the same age. No, and I think you can get someone who's maybe in their mid-20s because uh, Cregan's supposed to appear older than he actually is. He looks older. He commands that sort of respect. So you kind of want to get a manly-looking... Tom Holland. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) No, get an unknown. Get somebody who you can make into a star, but that's going to be fun for fans, too. We've got a couple of mentions of Winterfell in this episode. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and the line about a Stark is never broken an oath. <laughs> like, trust me, the Starks are in our back pocket. Those motherfuckers take this shit way too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we finally get that, like, Stark theme and see Winterfell again. Yeah, hell yeah. Winterfell with this new budget, right? See what it looks like. I think, if anything, the biggest criticism people may have of these this last episode is... Maybe some of the character choices. I've seen a lot of Damon so far, and I, I just don't want, like I was saying before, just to hearken in on that one moment and be like, oh, now I hate the entire episode. But I think a lot of people have also taken that with uh, the way Rhaenyra is portrayed and maybe, like we talked about with Aemon's, like just kind of a culmination of three different characters that people have problems with some of their actions or how they were portrayed in this episode. 
um, which is fair. I think a lot of people who are just regular viewers who aren't too much into the backstory or the characters will just take this episode and be like, whoa, that was crazy. I didn't expect that. That was, well, Damon, wow, he's he's kind of an asshole. Wow, that's didn't see that coming, but yeah, I kind of did. Whereas people who are more invested in the story and some of the characters may view it differently. So that's always an interesting dynamic. Yeah, we'll, we will see how people feel about this. And like I said, we will be back later in the week with our spoiler discussion. I think we're going to do a few videos. We're going to do one where we talk about the finale again, and then a second one where we sort of just recap the entire season. So that should be fun. And there's going to be a lot to talk about on both of those videos. Thank you guys for watching for this entire season. It's been so fun doing these reviews again, and we'll be back in two years for season two. You think we make it? No. <laughs> Talk about it. Well, by the way, infidelity. Damon is oh. finding some side dragons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess he's got this idea of we need more dragon riders, even though we have the dragon advantage. So he's yeah. prepping the big boy. Legendary dragon. So if anybody can get their hands on that one, I don't know. Maybe somebody will. We'll see. If I'm Caraxes, I'm not happy about it. Targaryens. What are you talking about? The Targaryens always banging other people. Sister wives and how many fucking wives did Magor have? You're like nine. We're talking humans here. <laughs> dragons, different story. <laughs> it's like Jake from Avatar. Just fucking hopping on that new dragon. All right, guys, that does it for this video. Thank you for joining us for this review. For Aaron the Nerd Suit Monkey, I am Bo Oliver. Before we sign off, I want to quickly spotlight our weekly podcast, The Nerd Suit Podcast, published every Wednesday at noon. Every week, you could join myself, Aaron, Teddy, and the rest of the Nerd Soup crew as we discuss the hottest stories in movies and TV, equipped with some off-the-cuff commentary on the world of pop culture, while also providing extended reviews for the movies and shows we love. You can subscribe to our podcast channel on YouTube at The Nerd Soup Podcast, which can also be found on our Nerd Soup homepage, and you can listen to episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Music, and all of the podcasting platforms we publish to. Thank you again for joining us on this review, and we will be back next week to review more House of the Dragon and some Game of Thrones content, so hope you guys tune in. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick Stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.